Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jennifer Cunningham. I'm the AVP of Alumni Relations here at Lehigh University. Thank you for joining us today for this half an hour, which I'm sure will go very, very quickly. We're talking today on this Mountain Talk to Professor Rick Bloom. Uh, he is the Robert Wiseman Research Professor in Cyber Systems, um, has several patents and several awards for the work in his field. So we're really lucky uh, that we grabbed some of his time today. Um, so just a little bit about the choreography of this webinar before we get going. Um, to ask a question, we use a chat box. So if you go down to the very bottom of your screen, um, there should be a, uh, a series of icons down there. There's one that says chat. It looks like a cartoon balloon with a couple dots in it. Click on that and a window will come up and you'll see where it says Zoom webinar chat and there's a message at the bottom right of your screen that says type message here. So as we get going, um, <laughs> thank you, Sid Weinstein says, quite the reflection on my glasses. Well, if I take them off, I can't see, so I'm gonna do this. <laughs> Thanks, Sid. <laughs> um, you'll see where Sid just typed, um, uh, type message here, and we'll see that. Um, and I will be asking Rick the questions as we go along so that he can focus on your answers. Um, the success of these does uh, does depend on your interaction with Rick and you'll get the most out of it. So please do think about your questions as we go along. Um, after the webinar, we'll send out a survey to get your feedback. And those are really, really helpful comments to us. Be completely honest so that we can make these better and better as we go along. All right, so now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Professor Bloom and he's going to give a five to 10 minute overview of what he does and then we will open it up to your questions. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say, first of all, that it's such an honor to, to get to speak to the alumni. I don't think there's anything that Lehigh faculty find more pleasing than speaking to the Lehigh alumni. They're really great people. So let me just jump into what I'm going to talk about. So lately, I've been working on cybersecurity for Internet of Things systems. And at Lehigh, we have, we're part of a $12.5 million center funded by the Department of Energy on cybersecurity for energy systems. It's really a great center. Uh, we have as a part, we have many multiple schools on, on the center. We have a uh, utility that's a team teammate in the center. We can test our technologies at this utility. Uh, we have uh, several, uh, many companies involved with the center. They help guide us and try to move our technologies into practice. We have uh, realistic laboratories at all the schools where we can also text, test our technology. Um, DOE is very interested in moving this technology into real products, so it's great in many ways. The one thing I'll say about it, though, is that these energy industries are regulated by the government, and so they're very, very careful about what they do. On the other hand, uh, if you look at the uh, commercial applications of, of Internet of Things systems, I'm much more worried about them. I think we really need to make sure that they are protected against cyber attacks and that this is taken uh, into consideration in, in, early in the process when we when we design these systems. And I'll give you a couple of examples of these Internet of Things applications that I think are very interesting and, and somewhat dangerous. The first one is, is self-driving cars, which I think really is, a, a, you know, taking everybody uh, uh, by surprise how rapidly it's moving along. And the interesting thing about this is that it, it kind of uh, brings in a lot of the, the things that I've worked on in the past, which seemed unrelated to, to this, uh, this great uh, Internet of Things uh, cybersecurity topic. Uh, so we've worked on like communications and radar and sensor processing and statistical decision making. It turns out now that all of the car manufacturers are putting radars in their cars. And the reason is that they all believe that fusing the radar data with video camera data is the best way to have these cars um, not hit people or animals or each other and they're actually many of them are trying to implement the radar technology on a single chip they're going to they're saying it's going to cost less than a dollar after mass production and so you're going to see radar everywhere not just in cars you're going to see radars uh, all kinds of applications like maybe monitoring your elderly parents you can with a radar quickly monitor how they're walking and see if there's some problem going on there so um, you know this is this is interesting because uh, we, we learned a lot of this because we actually invented a new radar technology called MIMO radar, which uh, made it quite a hit in the radar community. It's, the papers are said to be in the top 1% most highly cited papers. Uh, all these car companies are interested in it. Many of them come to us. 
Uh, we know they're testing it. We believe they may have already implemented this in their cars. They're quite secretive. It's hard to actually uh, say whether they did or not. So, but you know, we we, we believe that's the case. So, uh, interestingly enough, uh, IEEE is the is the Electrical Engineering Technical Society. I'm an IEEE Distinguished Lecturer, and I give lectures on these Internet of Things cybersecurity issues. And in those lectures, I talk about how it's possible to cyber attack these radar systems. And of course, this is very dangerous because we know that terrorists have already driven vehicles into people. Now imagine if they can actually take over these cars remotely, maybe not even be present at the uh, actual incident and, and, and cause lots of damage. Uh, so this is something to worry about. And, and because I think commercial systems have to be low cost, we really wanna make sure that people don't cut costs by leaving out the cybersecurity. There's many other um, examples I can give you. Uh, it turns out it's, it's actually not so hard to cyber attack your GPS, which we all count on. These cars are gonna count on them as well. And I think uh, the top application for Internet of Things systems is supposed to be in the medical industry, biomedical. Uh, and I think, just to give you a quick example, there's many things, but a quick example is it's anticipated that we'll be able to put sensors inside our body and these sensors will monitor our body, try to find problems before they become too severe. And then we'll also put these tiny machines in our body and the sensors will talk to the machines and these machines will fix problems before they become serious. Imagine if those kinds of systems are cyber attacked. And the cars, I should mention as well, it's not just cars, right? They're gonna cyber attack all kinds of vehicles like drones and this is you know, really something to worry about. So I think, you know, that lays out kind of maybe the general uh, topic I wanted to talk about a little bit today, and maybe it's good to maybe stop and take some questions. Yeah, so we do have one uh, from Mark Gravens. Um, I just finished my second contract at a power company. You're darn right they're concerned. They need to be concerned about security. Oh, it's an invitation. Please let me know if you have any interest in presenting on this topic to the Philadelphia IoT meetup. Oh, that would be fantastic. I mean, I'm, I'm an IEEE Distinguished Lecturer and I give lectures all over the world. I just came back from Australia, New Zealand. I've given talks in Italy recently, India, uh, all over the United States. Um, I have a very good talk, which I think is, um, can be, you know, as technical or non-technical as you want. I think that would be fantastic. And, uh, you know, we do look at uh, cyber attacks on, on energy systems like the grid and natural gas systems, but we also look at these commercial applications. And I think uh, the commercial applications are really scary. As, as scary as the electrical grid being attacked is, um, those people are pretty, pretty uh, careful about what they do. We have to make sure we're just as careful with self-driving cars and smart buildings and smart this and smart that. Yeah. So, so Andrew was saying, saying he did not hear the question, I just unmuted my microphone, so hopefully you'll hear me better, but uh, um, it was an invitation in case it's Andrew here in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Um, uh, Professor, Professor Bloom has uh, tentatively agreed to, to speak in Philadelphia to the IoT meetup. And by the way, if you need staff to uh, go with you on some of these <laughs> international trips, we can do that. We can also probably do some alumni. Well, I typically won't pay for that. But, uh, and they only pay for like one or two days each place. So I had to go through Australia and India, like jumping from place to place in two days, trying not to miss planes. And, but I am from Philadelphia. Well, I, I certainly loved in Philadelphia and would, would be very happy to go to Philadelphia. Nice. All right, a question from Sid. Do you think requiring the ability to update the software for IoT makes things better? Can we fix bugs and discovered flaws or worse, the risk of hijacked updates or malware? That, that is like such a great, great question. question. I mean, you're exactly right on. And uh, of course you do need the, the software to be updated. Of course, this also introduces cyber attacks. I can tell you in our center, uh, Department of Energy funded center uh, for cybersecurity for energy systems at Lehigh, we have lots of people. I'm the, I'm the lead for that, but we have lots of people working on different things. And that's something that has been worked on, trying to make sure that these software upgrades are not fake and would not take over the system. Uh, there have been attacks like that that have occurred in, 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 in practice. Uh, so you're right on. And of course, if you don't update the software, that's just as bad a problem. So 
to do these things secure is not easy. Uh, we actually have a, a person working on that. Uh, as I said, we have a utility that's a teammate in our center. That project was actually tested at the utility. Very, very impressive stuff. And I think Department of Energy was really, really happy that we were able to do that. Okay. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, Scott Koenig had a question. Um, what, what kind of opportunities are, are there in the cybersecurity space, entry level or otherwise, for a non-technical or a lower technical background? I'm very interested in the field. Um, Scott, can you just type in quickly what um, are you? What is your um, background? I just want to see so you can answer specifically. He is, oh, okay, so he's not answering specifically, but um, could you, oh, there he is. It's manufacturing and installation company. Well, okay. there, you know, uh, in, in Internet of Things applications, the top three applications are uh, medical is the top one, uh, manufacturing is the second one, <laughs> and um, the third one is energy. So I think in the future it's anticipated that we would like to very quickly and rapidly take data at one point on a manufacturing floor, send it somewhere else, completely reconfigure the system. To do that very rapidly with the security methods we have right now, mainly encryption, is difficult because if you encrypt the data at a sensor, send it somewhere else and then decrypt it, there's a large latency and you have to wait a while for that data to be unencrypted and that can actually make the control loops go unstable. So it's a big problem. So I know that we are working on methods to try to avoid the encryption or to do it very quickly. Um, we have, I have actually, my, one of my students is working on this. this. He was interviewed by PBS. If you wanna look on our website, you can see my graduate student talking about what he's doing in this area um, on a PBS interview. It was really great, he did a great job. Um, I think, you know, there are needs for all kinds of people in security. Um, you know, the way we look at trying to secure these kind of complicated Internet of Things systems like the grid or smart self-driving cars or whatever, you know, we want to have many, many layers of security. And if some of these layers are breached, we want there still to be other layers available to provide protection. What these different layers of protection do is quite different. So, so my focus is mainly on protection that specifically involves the cyber physical system, right? So the grid has mathematical equations that model it, and we use those in our cyber protection algorithms, along with all the sensor data, along with other data we have on weather, or past usage of the grid, all of these kinds of things and put them together. And we're doing similar things in smart car, but that's what I'm doing. But there's many, many layers of protection. People are doing all kinds of different things. Um, if you want to protect manufacturing systems, you need a person like yourself that understands manufacturing systems to, to, to use the cyber physical system parts of this, to understand how the, the manufacturing plays into it. How can manufacturing systems be attacked? What kind of attacks are damaging? The people that understand the application are the ones that could really do something in these areas. And, you know, the other layers um, are all kinds of different kinds of protections. Many of them, you know, uh, things that have been worked on before, you know, firewalls, encryption, you know, all the, the different technologies, you know, the, the people in our center, uh, we have people from all kinds of different areas. That, that one thing I talked about where they were trying to protect the upgrades to the software, that's, of course, a computer science person working on that. So we have people uh, in, this, in the center that are in computer science and engineering and different areas of engineering and operations research, economics, people outside the engineering college. There can be attacks on the economic aspects of the systems. Those are actually very important in energy systems. Um, Multidisciplinary research has really paid off for us. I think it's one of the main reasons why we were able to win that uh, large uh, Department of Energy grant. That actually started with uh, something called the cluster hiring. Let me give a shout out to the provost. The provost pushed this cluster hiring thing. We were the first cluster hire. We're called the Integrated Networks for Electricity. 
I was the director of that, um, it really paid off for us. Mm -hmm. I think you've answered this, but well, let me just make sure. I don't uh, think I answered what he said. But Neil, well, Neil Cohen's know. question uh, next is, seems like the IoT device manufacturers are the ones who are being relied upon to make sure they're secure. These are companies that typically don't have this area of expertise, and there are thousands of different manufacturers of parts. Is it realistic to think all these connected device manufacturers can make their devices secure, or is there an overarching level of security that can protect the systems? I mean, what you're saying is exactly what I'm saying. We need to worry about this, right? The energy systems, they're regulated. They're going to be protected. These Internet of Things systems, when you're talking about self-driving cars or sensors in your body, these are, sen these are systems we better worry about, right? So how are they going to be protected? Are we going to rely on the manufacturers? Listen, this is way over my level to figure this out, but I'm just pointing out that there's a problem here and we better make sure that these systems are secure. So maybe we need to change the way we do things. I don't know. Maybe we can get these companies to play along. I think, you know, I've spoken to many of these Internet of Things companies. They're very interested in making these, these products secure. Believe me, they don't want to tr try to sell a product that is not secure and that has been shown to be not secure. No one's going to buy that product. So I think, you know, it, it could work. But I think your question is amazingly on point here. You're exactly um, on point with what I'm trying to say. Yes, I agree with you 100%. That's a huge issue. Uh, John, John McCauley's question is, the assumption that most of these attacks originate outside or inside the U.S. or both? Okay, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, um, we have to protect the systems wherever these attacks occur, right? But, I mean, we have to be realistic and we have to look at what's going on in the world, in the news. And there are other countries that do seem to believe that cyber attacking us is maybe more efficient way to get at us than to do other things like a conventional war or some kind of physical attack. So we need to be prepared for that and we need to protect ourselves. And, you know, there's so much stuff in the news. You, I don't have to say much about what's going on here, right? I and mean, look at the attack on that uh, Sony, the, the film company. I mean, that really is scary, right? That they can, they can do that. And we have to be ready for that. We have to have many, many layers of protection so that there's no way that they can easily cyber attack us in those ways. Uh, Mitchell Liswith asks, I drive a Tesla. What's your opinion on how secure its operating software <laughs> and updates are? I would <laughs> I never to drive it to figure it out, right? <laughs> I would never comment on any particular product. That would be uh, really bad. And in fact, the Department of Energy would be really upset with me. They've already uh, been very clear about such things should never be uh, stated. Um, but, you know, I think... Um, it, Tesla is really impressive technology. Uh, I'm certainly impressed with that, and I'm impressed with all of the other things that are going on with self-driving cars. Uh, I can't really comment on the security. I, I don't know anyway exactly what the levels of security are there, but let's hope that they're going to put the security into those systems, and I expect they will because I don't believe that the uh, consumers will buy products that aren't secure. I think people are starting to become very aware of these things. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, all right, we had a question. Oh, uh, Mark actually sent out a note to the Philly IoT makeup, makeup so, meetup. So, um, and we also sent out the link to the PBS uh, special that you're uh, great. Great, you can watch my student. My student's yeah. amazing. Um, Howard Schwartz asks, is it not likely that offense will always be defense over time? Will we be closing the barn door after the horse has left it? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right that it's not an easy problem to solve. But as I said, I mean, if we have a lot of layers and these layers protect, you know, many different levels. So, you know, some of the layers try to keep you out of the system. Some of them may uh, assume you're into the system and still try to provide protection. Uh, and, and, you know, we have, we have some tricks. I mean, you know, the thing about having lots of sensor data and having 
maybe historical data, all of this machine learning stuff that's going on, you know, it can be a good thing as well, right? All this data can be relied on to try to figure out if something that you're looking at is really not, you know, consistent with the actual situation. Maybe somebody's issuing some kind of command somehow in a system, and this command just, just doesn't make any sense with the historical data, the sensor data, all of the other information you can pool together, right? So this, this age of big data could help us also. Uh, Desiree has an interesting question. I think it's about the opportunity cost of education. She's a um, former ed tech director who supported more applied learning to prepare K through 12 students for future jobs. And she asks, there's a debate about students learning cursive. With all the changes happening with IoT and biotechnology, how important is cursive for the growth and competition of America from your perspective? Wow, that's that's a really difficult question. I mean, some at some gut level, boy, I really hope that we all learn cursive and, <laughs> and that we don't go away from that. I mean, you know, I mean, I think at some point, you know, technology is great. I, I love technology. I, I love it more than most people, you know, but... Um, we need to be able to survive even if we don't have all this technology. And you know, that's one of the things that I guess is difficult because we kind of rely on all these things. I, you know, I made this, this example of GPS and I don't know about you guys, but I really count on my GPS a lot. My kids are really bad with it. I don't, you know, they're just totally using their GPS. I wonder if they could even use maps, you know, but I hope so. Um, I think, you know, it, it's actually not, that hard to spoof a GPS system. I mean, you know, the signals uh, are completely known what they should look like. An undergraduate can build a fake GPS transmitter very easily. Any undergraduate in Lehigh Electrical Engineering can do it for really inexpensive amounts of money. So, you know, you better be ready to work without your GPS and you better be ready to work somehow if your computer goes down. I mean, you, you need to be able to do these things and you need to be able to think. I mean, I don't, I don't think um, as engineers, most of us, I think uh, my age at least, uh, we're taught that, you know, you can run a computer and you can, the computer can tell you certain things, but you better have a gut feeling of whether that computer is telling you something right or something crazy, and you better understand it on your own. That's a really good point. Uh, we've got three more questions. I think, I think we'll be able to get through all of them. Uh, Cheryl Winters Tetro asks, what about all the tech that people are bringing into their homes, like Alexa and smart toys, like the teddy bear that was just banned in Germany? Yes, I mean, this is a fabulous point. I, I certainly, again, would never comment on any individual product. And as I said, um, my sponsor would not like that. And whatever my sponsor likes is something that I'm going to do. But, you know, these, these, these uh, Internet of Things uh, systems, uh, you, you need to be careful about those. I mean, there's a whole other issue here of, of privacy, which I'm not getting into, right? And, but I, I know that you can buy um, systems uh, of sensors to put in your home, and you can probably get them really inexpensively and um you know the reason for that is that a lot of these companies are mining your data and watching what you're doing and if that doesn't bother you okay but you know just be aware that uh a lot of these things that we get for free um you know these people are are, are, are able to do what they want with our data i think this is something that's been been talked about a lot very very recently uh, in Europe, I think Europe has taken a much stronger stance on um, how how your data can be used. And I, I really hope the United States catches on. I think the last few days I saw a Congress finally, you know, looking into some of this stuff. And I think that's really important. And I think, um, you know, most of these tech companies, uh, I don't think they, they really want to um, cause problems like this. But, you know, um, you know, we need to have, I think, probably laws in place that, that kind of uh, uh, make sure that, um, you know, we get the privacy we need. And um, I think most people should be careful about, you know, um, you know, these systems are great. When you put these systems in your home, uh, they're really great. They can do fabulous things, but you know, your, your, your data will be uh, somewhere and I'm not sure where it will be or what is being done with it, but you know, yeah. Um, 
to that point. Mike Mitchell was with the Tesla driver says he's he can still use his slide rule. <laughs> I mean you really have to be able to do it, right? Yeah. Um, Scott is asking another question about um, do you need a different type of work or educational background for cyber crime versus cyber security? Yeah, I mean, I guess you would. I mean, you, you'd have to, um, we certainly don't worry about uh, criminal issues. Um, you know, we do have a, uh, in, in our Integrated Networks for Electricity group, we have uh, people that do look at policy and things like that, because the policy is very important in, in, in the electrical system. And, you know, it drives a lot of what goes on, you know, whether people use renewables or not um, is, is driven a lot by policy. Uh, you know, we do also work on renewable energy, wave energy, and uh, solar energy, and wind energy, and uh, these things are great. Um, you know, I think to to uh, to actually have a career in uh, cyber crime, you you really would have to um, have a background in in um, in in, in, in um, law, I guess. You know, some somewhat, um, and and so that's that's an interesting area that we really haven't gotten into very much, but I'm sure there are people looking at this and, you know, these cyber physical systems are, you know, in themselves, they, they involve physical systems and cyber systems monitoring them. And now you're bringing in, so you have to know also about the legal system. Yeah. I mean, these kind of careers, I think will be uh, needed uh, people that, that understand these things. So those are great topics. Um, I don't know if anyone has basically a program in that right now, but it would be great, yeah. Um, so, so Howard Schwartz is going to get the last question in. Um, how can AI tools, as they evolve, help detect and combat attacks? Right, so that, that's ex exactly what I was trying to allude to. So we're using, you know, I, I wouldn't call it AI, I, I like to call it machine learning and big data, but, but you know, people are calling it AI. Yeah, we're using all that stuff, and I think you know, um, those 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 tools are are very strong in, in trying to pull together all the data you have, and you know we like to fuse that with sensor data and things that are going on right now, and all kinds of weather data, and maybe the system configuration, you know. So so these these machine learning algorithms really are the kind of algorithms that we're looking at to try to find these um, cyber attacks. So we, you know, we have a whole bunch of research on, on basically um, trying to detect cyber attacks on these Internet of Things sensor-based systems, and, and they're kind of using machine learning algorithms, really. I said that was the last question, but John McCauley's comment is very interesting. He says, it seems that given what students can do, that there will soon need to be a clearance uh, needed just to enroll in a program. <laughs> that adds a whole nother layer of um, with the registrar, right? <laughs> well, we don't, we don't, at Lehigh, we do not do any um, classified research. Um, you know, I, I do have funding from the Department of Defense. Um, it's all scientific funding. None of it's classified. The only thing they're looking for is to, you know, you, you to invent new things and to develop theory and publish papers. Uh, and in, in, as far as the uh, Cybersecurity Center for Energy as well, uh, we don't really do any classified research there. Of course, you know, the energy industry is very careful about what data they release. So we're not even really allowed to know the configurations of those energy systems because that would be information that people could use to attack those systems. So we don't use that kind of information. They, they basically give us uh, configurations that are, you know, cleansed, you know, made up in some sense, you know, but sort of realistic, but not the actual one. So we don't use any classified data. We don't we don't use any uh, data that's, uh, at Lehigh, we don't do anything like that. There are schools that do things like that. At Lehigh, we don't do that. I mean, we're, you know, my main goal is uh, to publish papers, to work with my students, you know, to, to invent new theory, publish textbooks, um, you know, develop the theory. We want that information to get out. So we don't, we don't focus on classified information. Okay. Well, that was a great ending um, to our half hour. We finished uh, here right at one o'clock. So 
Um, thank you all for these really fabulous questions. Um, I think I got a lot out of it. I'm terrified, um, but feel better that um, Rick Bloom and his students are working on this, uh, working to protect us. Um, so thank you again to everybody. And uh, Mark will get you in touch so that you can plan your time in Philadelphia. And um, thanks again. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. It was really nice to talk to the alumni. Nothing better for me than to do that. Bye-bye.